Raw commodities continue to hold their ground amidst a market sell-off in the risk asset space. But we'll be talking about mainly agriculture uh, and uh, the precious metals with Will Rind, CEO of Granite Shares. Will, welcome back to the show. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Thank you. Uh, before we get into specific assets, yes, broad market overview, huge sell-off we've been seeing in cryptos and stocks. Commodities have held their own relatively well, I say relatively. Gold hasn't done spectacularly uh, this year, but again, relative to stocks, they've, uh, gold has performed very well. So how are you interpreting this broad uh, macro picture that we're seeing right now where we're seeing uh, a dichotomy between risk assets and safe haven assets like gold? Yeah, so David, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of this macro picture. It's really extraordinary. This has been the worst start to any year on record for U.S. equities and U.S. bonds. So, I mean, think about that for a second, and that's the market environment that we're dealing with. And I think the biggest questions of the day in terms of macro topics are as follows. You have inflation and the Fed's ability to, to fight or control inflation being number one. You have the war in Ukraine, uh, number two, and the ramifications and the impact of that on global markets. And then number three, one that's perhaps not as talked about as much, although it's still incredibly important, especially when we talk about commodities, is China, particularly the slowdown in China, immediately resulting from the zero COVID policies that have been implemented and the lockdowns there. So th those are really the three, I think, core things at the moment to talk about. Um, but clearly, worst start um, on record as far as the data is concerned for right. equities and bonds. And obviously, as you briefly mentioned, absolute chaos in the crypto markets as well. Yeah, and that, that in itself might have ramifications for the rest of the markets as capital disappears. We'll probably see some liquidity dry up uh, and some dry powder dry up that could, be, could have been deployed to other areas of the markets, but now has vanished. So, um, yeah, very chaotic times for the markets indeed. Just in your point about China, well, uh, this is probably, most would agree, probably a temporary issue. Suppose China reopens its doors again after uh, things stabilize in the COVID fund, do you foresee U.S. equity markets uh, stabilizing as well? Or do you think there are other factors at play that may weigh down uh, stocks? I think, I think that, you know, certainly in terms of U.S. equities, um, it's going to help, obviously, some companies with supply chain that have supply chain issues. But I think more, I was thinking about it from a commodity perspective, that, you know, to me, that's one of the negative, the, the most obvious negatives that is short-term impacting you know, some of the major commodity prices, but particularly gold uh, and some of the metals, because yeah. you literally have consumption being shut down effectively, you know, massive, massive lockdowns in Shanghai, in Beijing. And obviously, if consumers can't go out and spend money um, at stores and they can't consume anything from jewelry, um, then it, it, that's going to have an impact on the price. Uh, I want to shift focus now to the uh, agriculture space. Uh, everyone's talking about a potential food shortage. I think that's um, uh, it's been trending all over social media and in news headlines around the world. It's a very dramatic term, uh, gets people's attention for sure. But do you think it's an exaggeration or do you think that's actually a realistic picture of what we're about to see? Keep in mind, food prices have gone up due to not just inflation around the world, but also uh, the situation in Ukraine, which has exacerbated the rise in food prices. Oil prices have also gone up as a result of Ukraine. And so we've got a lot of uh, forces working against uh, 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 price stability, especially on the food front. So what's, what's next? Yeah, it's already happening, David. I mean, put, put simply, the food shortages, lack of availability of certain items is already happening. Um, you know, I, I came on your program um, probably six months ago. My might have been longer, but we did a specific episode about shrinkflation. Yeah, I was we just going to bring about... that up. You were before <laughs> before we had. Yeah, let me just set the record straight. Before we officially had CPI tick up, you were the first one of the first guests on the program to call for higher inflation uh, because of what you've observed in real life. And you've said that usually shrinkflation happens before actual price inflation, which is the phenomenon that uh, uh, vendors uh, reduce the quantity before they actually jack up the price. So that was a great call, Will. Uh, but anyway, please continue. Yeah, so th that, that was already happening and has been going on for, for several months and continues to do so. Um, but you know, just go to any grocery store around the country and you'll see that shelves are not 100% stocked in the way that they were, you know, certainly before COVID. And of course, some of that is 
supply chain or, or have you know some of that as supply chain issues. But more broadly, and I think the point that you are getting to is there is severe disruption going on in agricultural commodity markets. And of course, we can point to Ukraine, um, the Ukraine-Russia situation as being one of the major um, you know, implications for that. But it's also the fact that we have a massive drought in the, on the western part of the United States, and that's been ongoing for several years now. And that's another thing that's severely impacting crops. You know, I go back to 2007, David, and in 2007, you know, before the financial crisis, we had a similar situation around the world you know, food shortages, very high agricultural commodity prices, and that led to social unrest in a lot of different countries. You know, in Mexico, there were the tortilla riots, and, you know, similar things like this happening around the world, particularly with countries that, you know, where, you know, they, they rely on, you know, core grains for a lot of the population. So it, it's already happening again, and certainly um, the lack of fertilizer as well that's coming out of, of Ukraine and Russia um, will be impacting things further. Fertilizers are a, a big problem. How do you know roughly the the size of the fertilizer market in Eastern Europe relative to the overall global fertilizer market? I I, I read that it's very significant in the sense that if that if that area of the world shuts down, uh, crops around the world are all in jeopardy. Is that is that true? Yeah, no, ab absolutely, and that's again to the point of why you know some of that is clearly reflected in the price of these agricultural commodities, because the market knows that if you can't get the fertilizer um, to farmers around the world in the same way that was available before, you know, that has to ultimately impact yields, um, which is going to be reflected in the price. Um, so no, absolutely, this is a, a big, big problem. I read a terrifying headline, I'm having trouble finding it right now, but uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, if, if we have a major shortage of fertilizers, farmers around the world would only have enough crops to sustain basically themselves. Um, uh, there's no surplus to be, to be exported to other parts of the world outside of their local jurisdiction. That's a scary thought because um, most of our country in the US and Canada, for example, a lot of our food is imported. Yeah, that's right. And it gets even worse you know, for certain countries around the world, which are almost 100% reliant on imported food, and clearly those countries are going to be affected the worst if they can't get, you know, grains or any kind of agricultural commodities in the same ways in the past. And, you know, countries that where governments are subsidizing uh, food in the first place, that only gets worse, as clearly you're having to step in as a government and subsidize uh, food prices more as prices spiral out of control. Are we gonna? We're gonna talk about investment implications in just a bit. But just personally, when you're reading the headlines, are you are you worried at all? Or do you think that this is going to impact uh, the West, uh, or is this mostly going to impact uh, developing nations as much? I mean, basically, I'm asking you if you're going out to Costco and stockpiling right now. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not personally um, at the <laughs> moment doing that. But you know, the, the sad this is the sad part, David. I mean the. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, this always impacts the you know, lower income countries the most because they're the ones that are more heavily reliant on you know, these sort of core agricultural staples. And a lot of the time, particularly if you're talking about you know, some of the hot countries, countries in the Middle East, Egypt, places like that, for example, um, that don't have you know, the conditions to grow a lot of these crops themselves, in other words, availability or access to water, that they're importing you know, almost all of that. And so you know, th this, is, this is a big problem and it affects those countries you know, disproportionately versus you know, wealthier nations. Mm -hmm. Suppose we do have massive food uh, shortages or even po food price hikes in some of these nations that you just talked about, the Middle East, Southeast Asia. Uh, would that have any direct impact on, let's say, their currency? Um, let's say uh, uh, trade, uh, would that have any impact on, on uh, spillover effects on the global financial system at large? I guess it depends, um, you know, obviously on the specifics and clearly, you know, it would depend on how severe it is, but mm -hmm. yes, potentially, or, you know, all of the above. Um, and certainly, like I said, we've seen this playbook before, um, certainly before the financial crisis where we did have uh, instability around the world due to very high agricultural commodity prices um, and it certainly ends up in social unrest and you know governments probably at the minimum 
stepping in to try and subsidize food prices. Right. Uh, well, the CPI print came out this week, 8.3% in the U.S., uh, slightly lower than the previous month, but uh, still relatively high compared to historic averages. Now, Will, what are the investment implications of, number one, sustained inflation, which we've seen, and number two, like we've discussed, potentially higher food prices? What could investors expect? Well, they can expect what's happening right now in the market, which is the market is not like this you know, very much at all. And it's this combination of high inflation, which, okay, you know, some may say that the number was bullish in the sense that it was slightly lower than the month before. And therefore, you know, that may indicate peak inflation. But th the trouble is, you've got interest rates rising at the same time. So real yields are increasing. And that's causing a problem for stocks. And that's causing a problem for even for gold as well, at least over the, the short term. And so, you know, all of that resulting in a very high US dollar um, and these, you know, very negative market conditions uh, where risk assets have just been absolutely pummeled, you know, whether you're in the NASDAQ or whether you're on cryptos, um, but certainly a very, very big problem with these rising interest rates and real yields um, in particular. OK, uh, let's shift focus over then to um, actually before we talk about PM. So agriculture space, do you do you recommend uh, investors go long on agricultures right now? Yes, because, you know, look, how else do you hedge against these inflationary pressures that we're seeing in the economy? And one of these one of the, the, the key inflationary pressures that we're seeing in the commodity space is coming from agricultural commodities. It's not just energy. Although energy will clearly grab the headlines because of people filling up their cars with gasoline on a daily basis and what they're paying in, in energy costs in the home. But you know, agricultural commodities have been rising uh, dramatically as well. And so it's not just the price of energy that's going up, it's the price of food as well. And one of the only ways to hedge against that is to actually buy those commodities um, themselves in a portfolio. Okay. Uh, gold, let's touch on gold. The, um, the macro environment theoretically should be very, very supportive of gold. Um, and again, gold has done very well relative to other assets. However, we're having a touch, tough time breaching $2,000 an ounce. You think that with inflation at current levels and uh, equity markets and risk assets falling as they have been, this is the perfect environment. What's holding gold back, you think, from reaching its previous high that we've seen in 2020? I think the main things are going back to you know the three big macro issues or talking points of the day, which is you know inflation and the Fed's ability to fight it. It's the war in Ukraine and it's China. Yes. And you could argue that um, we went from a kind of a positive scenario um, in all of those three to now maybe a, a negative scenario for gold, particularly on the inflationary front. You know, one of the biggest things that's holding gold back at the moment is the increase in real. Uh, interest rates or real yields. Um, the war in Ukraine was certainly a positive for gold, but has probably slipped in significance a little bit as the conflict seems to be more contained um, to the Donbass area or Donbass region. And then China, you know, went from you know positive to negative with the COVID lockdowns, the COVID situation, which I do I do think is temporary, but clearly the zero COVID policies are having an impact on gold. Um, by just restricting consumption. Um, so I think that's the situation that we're at at the moment. Yes. And certainly, um, I think if we, if we have seen peak inflation here in the market, and we have seen um, maybe evidence of the Fed perhaps uh, walking back some of these hikes, um, gold can do well. Uh, but I think we need China to come back online um, and you know, in the immediate term, some softening on the inflation fighting rhetoric from the Fed. Okay. Um, so your outlook on gold then for the remainder of the year, do you think uh, uh, forces such as the US dollar, real interest rates, do you think those variables will be supportive of the, of, of the precious metal going forward for the remainder of the year or not so much? I don't think they're, they're particularly supportive, David, um, in of themselves. You know, what is going to make it supportive is the fear returns. In other words, I think you know, the people have really just been taken aback. I think people are in shock right now in terms of what's happened since the beginning of the year. Uh, I think that people thought that, you know, equities were still very much in a buy the dip um, type situation. And people have been trying to buy the dip um, up until really the last week or so where we've seen just down days, where we've seen 
you know, almost entirely selling in the market. And that's, that's been very unusual, um, you know, compared to what's been happening the last few years where we've seen, you know, proportionate buying and selling on the days. So I think that, you know, this particular environment has taken a lot of people by surprise. You know, people that are in a 60-40 portfolio, for example, 60% equities, 40% bonds, um, have lost money so far. You know, that is, a, again, a point where what, at what point do those people change that allocation in a meaningful way and try and, um, you know, defend or preserve capital in a way that they haven't before. And I think, you know, the crypto market, again, carnage in the crypto market, and people are looking, you know, potentially to get out of, of crypto altogether. And where does that capital go? And I think gold, clearly, it all comes back to, you know, still one of the best uh, or highest quality assets, you know, in the world um, that is not correlated to any of these particular asset classes, be it stocks, bonds, or, or crypto. That's it. And so I think, you know, if we're not already there already, we're going to get there where people are realizing that they have to have some exposure to gold, they have to have exposure to commodities, um, and the weight of money that will flow out of bonds, out of equities, out of crypto, and I think gold will catch you know, a, a fair amount of that market share and that will benefit prices. We saw in the ETF market, you know, gold ETF holdings, we're not, we're not there in terms of the all-time high, um, but we're certainly on a pathway back to the all-time high. We're not as high as we were, you know, when gold hit an all-time high in 2020, but we're certainly on the path there. And I think if we get there, um, again, it's going to be out of fear, you know, and people moving out of these traditional asset classes and getting some gold. Right. Well, Hopefully the food shortage situation won't get as bad to the point where we can't afford to buy gold because we can't even afford to buy food. But uh, but uh, that's that's a very big oh, no. scenario. Yeah, let's let's not uh, let's not pray for that day to happen. I mean, it might be very supportive for gold, but uh, we won't be able to afford it. So uh, finally, let's close on the PGMs, platinum and palladium. Uh, they've had a, f a few spikes here and there throughout the year, but oh, the long term trend over the last one year has been down. Can you give us a summary of um, what's been driving the prices of uh, P PGMs? I think that it's, it's, again, similar to what we've talked about already, albeit I would just say it's going to be more exacerbated um, for these kind of metals that are more tied to um, the global economy, the business cycle uh, more specifically. So with platinum, palladium, again, you've had some of that risk premium come out of the Russia uh, angle. The Chinese situation um, certainly has affected those metals badly. Um, and again, just general concerns about global economy slowing down. Um, so that, that's really the main story, I, I think, with, with any kind of pro-cyclical metal at the moment. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your views and your updates in the commodity space. We'll look forward to speaking with you next time. Thanks, David. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on again. Pleasure is all mine. And thank you for watching Ketco News. I'm David Lynn.